Hello, everybody. We are back. Another science evening. It's Wednesday. It is 8.13 p.m. Pacific time. Where uh, This is where I am, where Blair is. Justin is looking it, confused. It's probably ridiculously what, early in the morning. Early in the morning in Denmark. That's right. There's something early in the state of Denmark. I am super excited to get our show going tonight and to talk about all the science. So let's do that since we are a couple of minutes. Ha ha, almost 15 minutes late. Let's get going. Okay, we'll start this show. We're going to start the show in... A three, a two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 933, recorded on Wednesday, July 5th, 2023. Free the science! That's right. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with slowing, shrinking, and hunting. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. A plausible yet daunting idea, for if previous concepts of the past are any indication, the story of humanity is a tale of the damned. Humans have seldom understood the past, and histories passed down through tradition, by spoken word, carved into rocks, written down on scrolls, read from books, contemplated, debated, and taught in schools are often wrong, misleading, self-serving, or entirely make it up. One element of modern society has attempted to put a halt to the doomed nature of humanity. Science. Through anthropology, archaeology, and genetics, the true evidence of human migration refutes the endless origin stories that have circulated and shows that we are but one people the braided stream of interconnected stories. Through population studies and medical research and epidemiology, we trace the paths of pathologies, pointing out the hazards, foretelling the risks to understand better how to preserve life based on the missteps of the past. In geology, the formation of strange features explained. In astronomy, the yearly meanderings of stars reframed. In physics, the fabric of space and time entwined. In cosmology, the birth of our universe revealed in every breakthrough research paper. An understanding of past knowledge leads to the current discovery. And while those who do not learn history may be doomed to repeat it, those who do learn from it, are celebrated here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again. So excited to be here to discuss all the science news from the past week that we want to talk about. Of course, there's lots of news out there. There's that like 5,000 stories yeah. a day. I don't it's know where we can get a fire all of it. hose. If you really, really get into it, it's a fire hose. But we're picking the good ones. We're picking the interesting ones. We're picking, pick, we're picking the ones worth your time, everybody. So thank you for being here and sharing your time with us tonight on the show. Woohoo! We have all sorts of great news. I have news about space, life, aging, and stinky hands. What do you have, Justin? I have a tale of people getting history wrong. Uh, I have ooh, a, a, a test of evolution and an idea that we've had on this show a few times. Potential therapy 
for Fragile X Syndrome and a Hepatitis C Unmasked. Unmasked. I didn't know it was wearing a mask. We'll find oh, out. Well, that's, that's the whole story. Now it's you like know. the Zorro of hepatitis. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Blair, what's in the animal corner? <sighs> oh, I'm keeping it simple this week. I have minks, I have bees, and I have ticks. Ooh, we don't like the ticks. We like minks. They're very soft. I have some oh. very interesting yeah. tick news this week. Okay, great. Great, great, great. And we always love bees. So, okay. All the good stories. We're excited for everything. As we get ready to jump into the science, though, I do want to tell everybody that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, see, so you're just jumping in right now and just hitting this part of the show, you can find us. Look for This Week in Science on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. We're also Twist Science on Twitch and Instagram and Universidon, and we're out there. Our website is twist.org if you want show notes and more information about us. And additionally, we stream live to the YouTube and the Facebook and Twitch on at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday evenings. That's why we're here now. Okay, time to start the science. Are you ready? Because I am going to dive immediately into the fabric of the universe. Ooh. Is because it, is it, put put is it put it in soft? your earplugs and your nose plugs. Very... You don't yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get anything out there. Like right. Well, teddy bear material. That's what I'm so expecting. Last night, not last night, last week was apparently a huge week for big physics. The big physics experiments were they were announcing all sorts of amazing results. Thursday last week, there was a press conference. Researchers studying gravitational waves announced their latest results, which have been looking into pulsar timing arrays to investigate the detection of gravitational waves. And we've talked about this detection of gravitational waves before in the context of the LIGO-Virgo experiments, which we know of as these laser beam interferometers that are located here on the surface of our planet. But because those interferometers are located on the surface of the planet, they are limited to the resolution that they can get, you know, whatever size of a wave washes past these detectors that is caught within their size frame. So we're planetary resolution limited. And researchers for a while have been like, hey, what else can we do? Well, we've got these pulsars that are out in the universe. And so maybe we can look at these pulsars. We've been studying pulsars for a couple of decades now. We've been measuring. We've been got all this data. Maybe let's go back and dig into the data and keep measuring and see if there are any differences that would be on the nanometer scale, really, they're looking at differences or the nanosecond scale in timing of the light signature that reaches our planet. Pulsars are usually these high energy stars that have a very clock based signature, very easy timing. We know that they're always going to burst at a, a an, the same integral of time on and on and on. But the idea is if they are a wash, in an ocean of space-time in which there are giant gravitational waves, millions of light years across, tens of thousands of light years across that have been produced by the merging of supermassive black holes, then perhaps we can start to pick up this larger scale resolution based on nanosecond differences in how the wave pushes and pulls the Earth towards or away from those pulsi pulsars and changes the, the time of those waves hitting the planet or how we detect them. And it's in nanosecond scales that they're looking at on the distance of light years, thousands of light years. So I guess the first uh, thing was we needed to come up with a clock that could handle nanoseconds because that seems like, hey, yeah. was that a nanosecond or was that like a million nanoseconds? I can't tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot yeah it's a bunch of nanoseconds but there but it the the amount of timing is this very accurate timing that they are using to be able to uh, detect these gravitational waves that are crashing and 
like ripples on the surface of a planet uh, or the surface of the ocean that are driven by the wind or if somebody throws a rock on a pond or one rock on one side of a pond and another rock on another side of a pond, how do those ripples interact and what happens to the stuff in between? This is another, uh, the, the data coming through is not necessarily surprising to astrophysicists they expected they were going to see differences. So what the results really are is a confirmation that now we can use pulsars to measure uh, gravitational waves on a, a, a massive, massive scale with a resolution that is a very high, uh, high resolution to be able to determine supermassive black hole mergers around us to be able to determine um, how the fabric of space-time is expanding, to be able to do all sorts of uh, experiments moving forward to confirm ideas about how space-time works and our place within it. Yeah, the only thing that... <sighs> well, so there's a requirement, it seems like, on this, that the... Quasar pulses be accurate to within nanoseconds. These are pul like, yeah, pulsars, I, not quasars. Or, pulsars. Oh, sorry, pulsars. Yeah. Because I kind of yeah. get like, oh, space is really uh, big. <laughs> I'm going to start at the beginning. Space yeah. is big. Okay. Yeah. So we have all these little beacons out there that are mm -hmm. pinging us. Bing, bing. Now, if they're completely uh, synchronous in their pings, ding, ding, ding. You know, if they're keeping a very steady nanosecond yeah. Each individual pulsar is. And so we're yeah. able to use all the different pulsars. We can tell and, once they yeah. uh, they get out of alignment, then we might mm -hmm. be able to, uh, right? Is that, is that the idea? Back engineer mm -hmm. uh, gravitational spatial stuffy movement over vast distances. Yes. Well, it's if they're exactly accurate, which are big things. Big things right, and... but that's the thing is that we have measured them so far to be very accurate, and a lot of researchers were like, "Well, is this going to work?" And then they started putting all the data together, and after about fifteen years of data uh, from some of these these places, there's the pulsar timing array in I think uh, Australia, and then Nanograv, who uh, is a that's another uh, the North American Nanohertz Observatory for gravitational waves. Um, there are is another group out of Turkey. And so there are these, it's an international consortium of researchers who have all separately kind of looked at their data and gone, hey, we have enough data that this looks like it's really going to be a thing and we can we can move forward with this. And that because, cool. yeah, the amount of data that they have is just, it. every year they get more and more and more. And it's not just one research group, it's multiple Pulsar research groups internationally starting to collaborate to be able to, in the future, pool their data together and get even stronger measurements. Um, you know, there are, there are questions as to whether or not, um, you know, string theory, the string particles that are going in and out of uh, existence, whether or not those, the string particles have an influence on gravitational waves and the the movement of space time and this is something that we can start looking at to see how matter dark matter other things uh influence space time but yeah the it's it is ridiculous these pulsars spin uh sometimes hundreds of times per second so the metronome actually is a super Very quick hard. metronome yeah and that's why it can be nanosecond or picosecond kind of scale measurements that's super cool. Yeah. So anyway. does I now I want to know like okay well it turns out like what are they gonna find it? Well, it turns out that uh, everything's moving sideways. I mean, we didn't know that before. <laughs> uh, the whole universe it's not just expanding it's moving off to the left a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well we haven't we haven't gone that far yeah haven't gone that far yet. Um, but another big question researchers have uh, been looking into that data was published this last week in Nature Astronomy is a question as to how Einstein's theory of uh, a general theory of relativity stacks up against how we see time and things and time move 
forward in the distant early galaxy. And we've been limited historically by supernova as our clocks, which take us about halfway back in the age of the universe. And we've been limited just by those supernovae as our clock. And so we're like, okay, well, going back about the half the time of the universe, we're not really seeing the reduction in in time's speed relative to where we are uh, right now. Mm -hmm. Because as we've, as we've seen, there have been other experiments where, where we've put gyroscopes on satellites, put them up into orbit around the Earth, and done timing experiments of clocks here on Earth and clocks up in those satellites just above our planet in orbit, and been able to show that there is a difference in relative time, where the time moves slower the further away from our relative, uh, our relative position the uh, the object is. So that's time dilation. And we haven't really been able to support it as much as we'd like with just supernovae. But now these researchers publishing in Nature Astronomy have been able to show using quasars, which are a different kind of pulsing object. These are at the quasars that are at the center of supermassive black holes. And they are the spinning energetic uh, uh, the, the the spinning energetic signatures that we can see that shoot out. And so they rotate and their beams, like, like a lighthouse beam, flashes past us as that beam of energy goes past. And so they go at a, a, a kind of set speed and we're able to get like, okay, the quasar, we can measure that speed. We know where it is. And these quasars, they can take it back to about a billion years after the Big Bang. And with the quasars, they have been able to support Einstein's general theory of relativity's uh, prediction of time dilation, and in fact, about 12 billion years ago or so, 11 billion years ago or so, there was, uh, if that time appears to be flowing a lot slower than time appears to us right here, right now. Yeah, well, you know, I don't think we needed Einstein for that, to be honest with you. No. Like, I'm only approaching 50 <laughs> past it maybe and i can tell you things are speeding up things That's are true. oh boy time is going by a lot faster than it was just uh, some decades ago so, you need to do new things lots of new things they're supposed to slow time down i guess to the human brain i don't yeah i don't know whatever but um but the researchers, this is a very novel uh, ability to be able to take the ticking of the quasars and apply it to a standard clock that can be used similar to supernovae for measuring the speed of time and to be able to show that, yay, expanding universe, time moving more slowly, further away, further back from us. Woohoo! Another Einstein nail in, in that um, structure. And then the final cool thing that uh, a project I've been following for many, many years is the Ice Cube uh, experiment, the Ice Cube collaboration down at the South Pole, Antarctica. These researchers have uh, been hunting for neutrinos for a couple of decades now. And in their hunt for neutrinos, they have taken the cleanest ice in uh, that they could find on our planet which is this beautiful, clean ice, clear, 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 with no uh, compounds that, uh, that get in the way. And they try, and they've created these detectors that detect neutrinos, which are highly, highly energetic particles, but that don't really interact with anything. So unlike cosmic rays, which bump into stuff and then produce neutrinos, um, the neutrinos themselves, they come in and if they hit a detector, they don't really turn into anything else. And because of what they are, researchers can figure out where they came from. Now we have a bunch of neutrinos that we can track back to nuclear facilities here on the surface of our own planet using uh, machine learning algorithms. The ice cube collaboration has now figured out how to take out the noise of cosmic rays that hit our atmosphere and then create a shower of neutrinos down onto the planet. And so they have been able to get a picture that is their most recent result that they have uh, reported on of the uh, Milky Way. So they are using their neutrino array. They've been able to, to visualize a bunch of locations within uh, within the Milky Way galaxy's uh, silhouette that we can see. You know, we're looking at it 
kind of from the side. And there are a bunch of locations that appear highly energetic. They don't know what exactly they are. Uh, they haven't pinpointed them specifically, but uh, they do coincide more with the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, it's just a very exciting advancement. And so we'll be hopefully seeing them clean up the data a bit more, get more data on the neutrinos that they're uh, detecting, and eventually be able to get a really interesting picture of the inner Milky Way galaxy and the most active uh, structures within the Milky Way that um, go into giving the Milky Way the structure that is the galaxy we live in. So, so to summarize, yeah, uh, this past week, we may have <laughs> seen... <laughs> The been able to figure out how to see the structure of gravity throughout Deep. space, mm -hmm. the structure of time mm -hmm. throughout space, yeah, and the, <laughs> identified all the little uh, neutrino emitting objects in in our galaxy. Galaxy. Yeah, and then once we start looking at our galaxy, then we can maybe look outward and see out of our galaxy. But we're yeah, we're we're looking it's big physics this week. That's like kind I, of a big week. Kind That's of a kind big of a lot. Week. I know. Should spread it out over the year a little bit, but yeah, I, go for it. I was all laughing. Once. I was like, Ice Cube. I mean, normally people would be super excited about the Ice Cube neutrino stuff, but like the you know gravitational waves. I mean, that's a big one, and they're both announcing right at the same time. I mean, all this stuff coming out. They're probably all, I think it was all announced last Thursday. That's <sighs> There's only so much we can Ooh. do. But yeah, moving forward, we can hope for many more amazing uh, big physics results. Because well, Maybe not many more. That might be like, <laughs> that's kind of a lot right there. It's a lot, There's... but I think we're on like the, these experiments are starting to bear fruit that, you know, we're... Yeah begun decades ago and are, have been building and building and building and we're starting to really see the the data come through and the information come in and so these you know these structures and these pictures of our uni universe are slowly starting to make form you know come into form come into focus so something very similar is taking place in medicine yes uh, right now so we have talked a little bit about prime editing which is already mm -hmm. showing some tests of being able to change genes within your body in, in you, while you're alive, swap them out. So if you had a genetically based or gene based uh, uh, variant disease, they can get swapped out curatively. Uh, you know, still five to 10 years, but legitimately five to 10 years, they've tested it and it works in some experimentation, right? Uh, there's base editing, which is another way of doing this. There's the immuno uh, universal donor stem cells. There's a universal CAR T cell therapy. There's more and more of this, like we're on the cusp of talking about real intervention, uh, real therapeutics and real cures for diseases that up till now have not been treatable. And so uh, I bring you fragile X syndrome may have a therapy on the way with yet another method that researchers are using to combat disease. So Fragile X syndrome is leading inherited form of intellectual disability. It's a big part of the autism spectrum disorder. Patients can present with behavioral alterations, hyperactivity, impulsivity, anxiety, uh, as well as poor language development skills, seizures, tendency towards the lower IQ as it is a neurodevelopmental disease. So it's a genetic disorder that disrupts a single gene. Now, it's not like nobody's studied this. People have worked on this. People have uh, tried to do stuff on this. It attacks basically one gene, FMR1, which is uh, then named fragile X messenger rib ribonucleoprotein because uh, it's so involved in this one disease that they've been studying. Many genes, though, produce more than one product, and fMR1 does more than most. It's hundreds of mRNAs are being expressed incorrectly and spliced into white blood cells, brain tissues, and individuals with fragile X syndrome. 
leading to the large swaths of symptoms and distributed neurological development pathology. So, researchers have discovered that a large part of the problem is the splicing of the mRNA. So, the little bit of mRNA gets copied off the gene, and then all this, you know, genes get spliced into different mRNAs. They go on to then become different proteins, which then can be further modified to go on to do different tasks in the body. So one gene can make hundreds of different proteins that all have different tasks. And they're finding that it's this missplicing taking place that's the problem, and not the gene expression itself, not methylation of the gene that has been previously believed. Enter, I'm going to keep messing this up, antisense uh, oligonucleotides, which are basically a form of engineered single-stranded DNA that can be used to bind to mRNA sequences. They bind to specific sequences based on how you've engineered them, and they can do all sorts of interesting things. They can induce degradation, so... Uh, that little bit of mRNA uh, breaks down. They can modulate splicing. They can do prevention of translation. So it's there, this gets attached, but it never gets turned into a protein. They can interfere with alternative mRNA processing, event, uh, processing events, which then can either inhibit or upregulate the production of mRNA, which then inhibits or upregulates the production of downstream proteins. Right. In this case, researchers develop antisense oligonucleotides to form a little patch that sits there on the mRNA and it causes the splicing machinery to skip past the improper splicing spot in the, in the RNA. So the mature mRNA is formed without the misplicing event. They did a little bit of collaboration with some RNA therapeutic field experts, and they found a two antisense oligonucleotide combo successfully inhibited the misplicing, uh, as well as uh, uh, had a little bit further effect. So basically, the, this led to the production of normal levels of the protein FMRP. The absence of those proteins defines fragile X syndrome. So as far as the cells that they were working with in a lab are concerned, they have a therapeutic cure. Okay. Wow. So as far as the cells are concerned at this point, the cells, they're taking, they're fixing the problem. So that yes. it fundamentally is saying, okay, you have this, this mis, this mistranslation and you're missing it, this one part. And so we're going to, fill it in, we're going to make sure it doesn't get missed, and then you, the cells will be fine. And so yeah. now now you just have to make sure that it works in mice and then in primates and then in humans, right? And so they have to move yeah. now move forward through all the clinical trials, but yeah. that's So it's amazing. really interesting, too. Okay, so so yeah. currently anti, uh, artificial antisense uh, oligonucleotide therapies are in various stages of clinical trials already across a wide range of RNA-based diseases. There's rare skin diseases to very common neurological diseases. There's a lot of potential for the artificial antisense uh, oligonucleotides, including potentially, hopefully, a new name at some point. <laughs> uh, Not so long. I'm sure if it becomes an inje injectable drug or, you know, something yeah. of that sort, it'll have a nice proper pharmaceutical title. You can call it ASO uh, right yeah. now for sure, or you can go RNA therapy going mm -hmm. forward might be okay. But RNA could, like, therapy is like vague. It could it's, be. Yeah, yeah, it's a little broad sounding. So yeah. anyway, this uh, also, this is, the, this is the huge part though. This is actually the biggest lesson takeaway, I think, from this. This is the, according to Joel D. Richter, who is a researcher, who lead researcher on this particular project, we never would have found this using a mouse model of Fragile X. The mouse model is a gene knockout. Because it simply doesn't have the Fragile X gene, there is no mRNA that is made. 
Right. We only Nothing discovered this yeah. miss splicing because we were working with human cells. So huge alert to all genetic diseases that are being studied in knockout mice. Uh, have you checked for the misplacing in the actual cells first? Because that's, that's, you know, turning out to be a huge thing. And it kind of actually, it, in a weird way, so I've heard about this anti-sense oligonucleotide therapy before. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's being used some very, for, uh, towards some very common diseases. It's being used for a lot of extremely rare diseases that nobody's ever heard of. And now I'm starting to wonder, like, is it because the labs who were working on that, like, weren't structured uh, or didn't have access to knockout mice, wasn't in the budget, they don't have the, the space, they're working on this niche disease because, you know, hey, nobody else is, maybe we should do this. And because they had to work with actual cells and didn't have the fancy mouse knockout models, they were able to see the misplacing. And that's why there's so many of the applications for this for very, like diseases you haven't heard of with a very slim amount of people who are even uh, yeah. getting it. And there's a ton of therapies underway. So just add this one to that list, that stack <laughs> of new interventions, therapeutics and potential cures that are in the pipeline, uh, thanks to science and medical research. Yeah, and that we, it, this one particular disease might be cured, well, fundamentally, by this as a treatment, and it could also impact a lot of others just as a, as a methodology. Yeah. And it's, it, and it's gonna be yeah. interesting because this is also, it's a developmental disease, so you kinda have to wonder, yeah. like, is this, is there going to be a, uh, a sort of reversal effect that's possible? Is this going to be something that's right. an early intervention that or, then allows yeah. regular development so that, oh, you get the word fragile X, uh, the and, early stage, and, and you is don't it, have to panic. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you'd early. want to get it early, I wish, I'm sure, but yeah, there's a lot more research that needs but to be done to see how it, like, yeah, it's, it is yeah. a breakthrough. So there's yeah, yeah. a lot of... We lot don't of know. So many. Blair, I have questions about mink brains mm -hmm. fragile mink brains mm -hmm. fragile are they fragile uh yeah i mean them along with many other animals we have domesticated have brains that shrink during domestication this is a phenomenon that is well studied and to this point the expectation was that once you shrink you can't go back so when oh, a, no. when a yeah once when one you of shrink these... you're a mink no you were a mink before too, but this time you're a dumb one, I guess. I don't know. But so sheep, pigs, cows, basically all domesticated animals, mammals specifically, have smaller relative brain sizes compared to their wild counterparts. counterparts. But um, American minks appear to be special because the ones that have escaped captivity and have become kind of these feral minks in Europe, even though they're American minks, they have regained some of their brain size by being in the wild over 50 generations yeah so generally speaking they these domesticated animals do not regain relative brain sizes to ancestral forms even in feral populations but part of the reason that that's understood is that it's really hard to study this how do you study a wild individual a domesticated individual and then a domesticated turned feral individual all at the same time in large enough numbers to come up with statistically significant measurements. It's How very difficult to do. Yeah. And so um, then the American mink is a perfect individual because they were domesticated for the fur trade over a century ago. They were bred in Europe then for fur farming and captive animals escaped. So you have wild minks in North America you have domesticated minks in Europe in fur farms. And then you have the feral mink that have escaped in Europe. So you have three distinct populations. They are not cohabitating. There is no bleed over. And so they have these really distinct uh, data sets. On top of that, you have the, um, the situation with mink where it's really easy to measure the brain case. Why? Well, there's museum collections of American wild minks 
the fur farms obviously get mink skulls regularly. Yeah. But yeah. via fur uh -huh. <laughs> procurement. And hey, then, you mean they um, don't shave them? I thought they were like... <laughs> Clippers, no, you blood. need the skin there. Is the um, you take the whole skin for this, not yes. just the fur. Yeah, yes. it's, not, it's not like And sheep. then you it also have yeah. the fact that the American minks that have escaped in Europe are feral. They are invasive and therefore they are regularly cold. And because they are cold, because they are eradicated from the wild, they have collections of mink skulls over time from these feral populations. So you're able to measure the skull case of all of these different minks. And so they were able to calculate relative brain size related to their skull. And the brains of captive bred mink shrunk about 25% compared to the wild ones from America. But in contrast, the brains of the feral mink grew back almost all the way to the wild size within 50 generations. So the, there's a couple things going on. Our we misrepresenting how this works in the wild or are minks special now minks along with um other weasels because they're in the weasel family as well as shrews and moles have a process known as dental's phenomenon which is where they have seasonal changes in their brain size so they actually have this kind of plasticity related to brain size built into their genetics already so it's possible that these minks along with shrews and moles and other weasels um, could have kind of special adaptations that allow them the flexibility to grow those brains back to normal size. Or it could be that we're just bad at measuring this data because it's hard to get and everybody has the potential to get their brain size back. We don't know. But what, what we do know is that this bucked the expectation of how domestication works. So We're also looking at the issue of whether or not they're collecting, I mean, I guess they're doing a big, broad sample, but what season are you collecting the animal in? How old is the animal? Right. How does, you know, age and seasonality, if we know that the brain does grow and shrink, um, you know, how does that all tie into the way the measurements work out? Right. Well, and then the other thing is, yes, they got back to the size they were at. Are they using their brain in the same way? Is it is it wired the same way that it was originally? So yeah. that's the piece we don't know. All we know is just based on size, they're getting the size back. But how are those brains functioning? Are they functioning like wild minks? Or are they just smarter domesticated minks now? Did they have to write new pathways? Like what's happening in their brain? That's way harder to figure out. But mm -hmm. maybe someday. Yeah, I, I think that's a fascinating question. You know, do, what is the actual change that's happening? Even though we're seeing the size come back, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I love it. I love studies like this. This is a, what a neat use of all the different the data sets and the different ways of getting all that information together to be able to answer the question, at least or at least start to get at it. It's very cool. Um, let's see. Scientists have been looking into why aging? Why? Yeah, why? Stop it. <laughs> why? We why? don't want. <laughs> we don't want. There are, there, there are organisms on our planet. Usually they are, you know, related to our jellyfish ancestors that we, you know, haven't really been close to for, you know, 500 million years or so, 600 million years. But anyway, uh, there are lots of squishy, water-based animals that don't like to age, that can almost live forever, that just keep regenerating themselves. And scientists are like, okay, we're going to look at you, you little squishy water hide tunicate type things. What are you doing to stay alive forever? And you know, how does that different from the mammals and other vertebrates who like to die? Well, maybe not like to, but do die. So what's going on there? Well, there's a process in aging, which is known as senescence, where suddenly the cells start to deteriorate, tissues start to deteriorate. Um, and it's a period of time of known deterioration. And there are well, certain and molecular... And it's a good thing. And it's a it really is... good thing. 
Yes, senescence is good. Apoptosis is good. Like there are lots of these cell death processes that are really great. Like yeah. you don't want all the tissues to grow forever. You want there to be stops somewhere. If once Cancer. there's problems, right. that's you get into right cancer territory and all that other kind of terrible stuff. Yeah. So uh, these researchers were looking into a, a species of of organism, little sea creature called Hydractinia symbiolongicarpus. And these are little tiny tunicate type t sea creatures that are related to jellyfish. And um, they live on the backs of hermit crabs. And they have little, little tubes and little fingers that come up from the tubes and they sway in the water and they collect their food into their single mouth that goes into their tube where they digest it. And then they probably poop out of their mouths too, but that is not something we're talking about right now. What we're really talking about is the fact that if you were to look at these hydractinias, they have a collection of stem cells that they keep toward their base, basal midsection. And they keep those little stem cells in reserve in case anything goes wrong. And they can keep growing from those stem cells. The stem cells are a very important part of how they regenerate. However, those stem cells, relative to the size of these hydra hydractinia, are far away from the mouth region. If you cut off hydractinia's mouth, it will start to regrow itself. It will regrow a whole new thing without any of its stem cells. And so the researchers are like, what's going on there? And so they got into looking at the compounds that were released from the cut area when they cut off hydractinia's mouth and what was released there. They found there were a number of components that were similar to senescent compounds in vertebrates and animals that go through aging and have tissues that die. And so this was a very fascinating discovery for them because as they publish in Cell Reports, that this, this leads to a realization that the processes of healing and aging are intertwined and that possibly aging evolved as a result of healing in the first place. And that we wouldn't have aging if it weren't for adaptations and selective uh, mutations that have moved forward uh, because of healing and survival. So no more healing for yes. me. <laughs> Stop healing, Blair. That's it. <laughs> yeah, but it's... Oh, no, no. Yeah, I, I really I appreciate this study because it does uh, kind of bring that kind of life and death, aging and birth, you know, into this full circle of, uh, of, of scientific inquiry uh, and discovering that there are these connections molecularly that can be with senescence that, and aging that can be tied to healing and regeneration in the first place. And this may give us some very um, interesting pathways to go down when it comes to doing things like regenerating nerves or limbs or even living forever. We've, Fun times. We've back engineered a, a sea creature that allow you to live forever, but there's, there's, there's one compromise you're going to have to make. Uh, you're going to have to poop out of your mouth. You have to poop out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not talking about that. <laughs> That's the only one really I feel about. like you also have to give up your bones. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't need uh, bones. I'm going to want those. those you, are have to look like, you have to look we haven't like figured those, out wind, those yeah. wind, those, those fan, those fan dudes that they blow up outside of auto dealerships. Oh, yeah, dealerships. the inflatable, the inflatable tube inflatable, guys. Inflatable yeah. tube guys. That's kind of what I imagine. Yeah, yeah that's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Justin, tell me about minimal cells. Is this like minimal techno? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Why not? <laughs> uh, so a real test of evolution has taken place, ladies and gentlemen. The simplest possible organism would be one that possesses uh, only the minimum number of genes, just what it needs to survive and reproduce and nothing else. This also 
would make it very unstable, as any mutation could be lethal. The more efficient the model is, the less likely that any changes to it can be good. So how did evolution ever get going if life is so precarious in its sort of rudimentary state? Researchers in the Department of Biology at Indiana University decided to answer that question by taking bacteria with a small genome, 901 genes, uh, in the wild type, and eliminating everything but the core survival essentials to live and reproduce. So they, they got a reduction of 45%, dropped the bacteria from 901 down to 493 genes. In humans, we could lose like 98% of our genes, I think, and we'd still be okay. But this one, 45% drop down to 493 genes. A smaller genome at 493 than any wild organism known to science. If there's one thing that history of evolution has taught us is that life will not be contained or constrained. Life likes to break free occasionally, expands into new territories, it crashes through barriers, As painfully, Jeff maybe even says it does what? dangerously. Uh, eventually, life uh, finds a way. Right. And in a lab in Indiana, life did just that. So over the course of 300 days, the sequence shorty showed off an intensive mutation rate, highest recorded of any cellular organism ever. It was somewhat expected, I guess, because organisms with smaller genomes have uh, been shown previously to have higher mutation rates. And the bacteria they were working with already has an elevated mutation rate. So while the rates were faster than the wild type of the bacteria, it wasn't crazy, that crazy faster, just faster than the wild type. It was allowed to evolve freely for 300 days and then tested along with its streamlined version and the wild type. Essentially, the wild type bacteria and the streamlined version are placed in the tube. The wild type takes over. Good uh, data point to the discussion that we've had a few times on the show about why life doesn't seem to de novo be starting from scratch on Earth over and over and over again. Once niches are filled, there's no way for new basic genomed life forms to get started. They lack the attributes to compete. So the wild type versus the, the completely uh, shortened version, the wild type just took over the tube. The shortened version didn't make it. Now, in the wild type versus the 300 day evolved strain, the evolved strain held its own pretty well. So life finds a way and quickly uh, through 300 days, uh, of evolution in it by itself, the bacteria technically went through about 2,000 generations, which would be 40,000 years of human evolution if you calculate it that way. Though based on population and mutation rates, that small 493 gene genome, uh, a new mutation would hit every nucleotide in the genome more than 250 times during that 2,000 generations. So Ooh. a lot of opportunity to find out what works and what doesn't yeah. in, that, in that experiment. So along the way, the experiment, uh, experiment the, uh, along the way of the experiment, the researchers uncovered genes, proteins, and traits that are critical to evolutionary performance of bacteria with the smallest genome of any organism grown in pure culture in the laboratory. In what researchers are calling the ancestral state, the working approximation of minimal cells had significantly reduced fitness with less than the 500 protein coding genes that it was allowing, and very few redundancies. So theoretically, it could have, and maybe should have, just gone extinct. Instead, what they witnessed was natural selection during extended laboratory growth outweighing any deleterious effects of genome disruption and drift, leading to a more robust form within a year. I think that's, a, that's very impressive. That, yeah. they, that even with the minimal amount of genetic material that was there, that wasn't like a constraining factor. I mean, it, it, it's a bit constraining in that there's not as much genetic 
diversity within the genome to begin with, but the fact that there is mutation happening, single nu nucleotide mutations, there are insertions and deletions over those 300 generations that impacted it enough so that the fitness increased, it was able to compete, the uh, that minimally evolved ancestor or that minimally involved cell, that that version of life, bacteria, even though it had just enough to, to survive, it was able to change and compete. And that should give us pause when we think about where life came from in the very beginning. And yeah, the, and it's a great, yeah. I think it's a, uh, a great example of what, again, what we talked about, about why life doesn't keep uh, showing up over and over and over mm -hmm. again, because, oh, you know, you can't compete when you don't have anything but the ability to eat one thing and reproduce. There's somebody else has got that niche. Somebody else is going to fight you for it and they got skills. The other one is that this didn't have, like you were just saying, this didn't have a population uh, with which to keep it. Like, oh, you're different than me. And then I, at first, you know, it starts, they are all starting the same. And it's mutation evolution completely ran the show in the beginning. And then maybe towards the end, now you're like running into other successful versions within the population that are that are becoming this more robust form that's able to survive. But uh, it, it shows that that mutation uh, evolution and selection from that is very powerful, actually m much more powerful Robust. in those early stages. Yeah. Yeah, that those early stages, as long as there's enough there, then there is enough to grow and compete and to, uh, I mean, I think it would be interesting to see how much, you know, how much longer does it take? How many more days of evolution would it take on the minimal cell to get to a point where it can outcompete or really, really truly compete fitness wise with the non-minimal cell, the original wild type? And, and basically then, how to get, how long would it take that question with the mink brains, right? How much, yeah. how long would it take before it got back to that kind of wild type version and when it yeah. did get back to the wild type is it just like the wild type or you know what are the differences and we can see that filter right there i think that could be cool yeah. and then that's the other thing is like these didn't have any competition but each other right yeah I mean, so they're like we're just gonna grow and see who's better at growing in this space using the same resources uh still probably a pretty friendly competition compared to going out into the environment where there's all these other strange bacteria and viruses and creatures that are out there trying to get you. I don't think it would have done as well there. I'm, I'm right. just guessing without any exposure <laughs> to any of that before. Probably would have failed even worse. But uh, but did really good holding on its own against its wild type, uh, more advanced version of itself, I guess. Yeah. And I think this uh, pulls right into my last story for this first part of the show here. Uh, research out of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this week. Uh, chemists at MIT were focused on bacteria for their paper that was just published looking into um, uh, looking into photosynthesis and the efficiency of photosynthesis. And in their study, they were looking at the photosynthetic reaction center, these light harvesting proteins that are involved in the light harvesting complex to figure out how, you know, efficient photosynthesis is in plants and in bacteria and why it's so efficient and why can't we do photosynthesis as well? Why, you know, what do we need to do to make it, make it work well? And very often when we're putting together our uh, photoelectric diodes and the and the the solar panels that that we're constructing everything's in a crystal lattice it's all neatly ordered the crystalline structure allows the electrons to flow very easily it all makes sense but the big news from this study is that when they tried to control the size of the membranes and the distance between the proteins involved in the light detecting the light gathering structure in uh, these photosynthetic purple bacteria, they found that when they made it nice and ordered, that wasn't as efficient as when they just let biology be messy. And so photosynthesis was better and more efficient with disordered 
just wherever it goes kind of placement of these of these proteins within within the membrane. So it's a that's awesome. That's like entropy is yeah. the plant. It, yes, it kind of, yeah. but it, it's really it's the researchers themselves uh, commenting on this study. Uh, they say ordered organization is actually less efficient than the disordered organization of biology, which we think is really interesting because biology tends to be disordered. This finding tells us that may that may not just be an inevitable downside of biology, but organisms may have evolved to take advantage of it. Evolved yeah, to witty. take advantage of disorder, yeah. right? Yeah. Why bother folding your clothes? Just throw them in a pile. <laughs> You're wasting efficient. your energy. I disorder. It's disorder. Your array, your disarray is going to make your life more efficient. <laughs> it's, I've seen a lot on social media lately about doom baskets. That's exactly what this is about. Like, why are you, why are you putting all this energy in to creating order where it's not required? Mm -hmm. If it's not required, it's a waste of energy. Right. And that is specifically, you know, the chemical aspect of what they're looking at and the, the thermodynamics of it or the, you know, how does the energy flow? That's right. Disorder. Love it's better it. in biology. Hee <laughs> hee. Which I think is so much fun. Well, this ordered, disordered twist program, we've been here for you and we're so glad that you are here joining us for another episode. If you're enjoying the show, please tell a friend about Twist today. Oh, and while you're talking with your friend about Twist, maybe take some time to head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. Click on that Patreon link, and then you can choose to support the program moving forward because we are listener supported and we would really very much love your support ten dollars or more per episode. And we will thank you by name at the end of the show. Additionally, $15 and more, and you'll get a new sticker with Twist art, art from Blair, fun things from Twist moving forward. We hope that you do decide to support us. We can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. All right, it is time to come back now to that part of the show, that part of this week in science that is filled with animals. Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? I got the buzz on bee homes. Oh, bee homes. Yes. Wait. Okay. So hive, yeah, there are hives. That is a thing. Many bees and wasps live in colonies of several thousand individuals, but there are also solitary bees. So when you see things like bee hotels that people make, these are usually for solitary bee species or for bees who don't have a, a colony or a hive of, of their own. Excuse me. Um, one of one of these solitary bees is the horned mason bee, Osmia cornuta. I was saying that wrong. Um, they, they choose a nest site. They use, uh, usually will use existing cavities that can be abandoned nests of other bees. It can be wall cracks. It can be artificial nesting aids like the bee hotels that I mentioned before, which are usually, um, it could be, you know, pieces of bamboo or uh, little wooden dowels that are hollowed out, any number of things. But they like their little nooks and crannies. But the question is, how do they know what their cavity is? Which, how do they know which hole is theirs? When they go out and they, they pollinate and they, they munch on, on nectar and then they come home, how do they know which hole is their home? And so uh, previous studies have suggested that it's all about vision. They recognize it based on how it looks. That one's mine. It's how we usually tell. Yeah. Mine I mean, is the bees blue have house pretty good with, vision, right? Yeah. With such and such number on it and the and the mailbox shaped like an elephant. That's my house, right? So <laughs> I'm just manifesting for my future house. Anyway, <laughs> um 
that was the previous studies. They, they all said that it was based on vision. But um, research, researchers this week, they were skeptical. They thought there was something else going on. And they did chemical analysis and they did some behavioral experiments to show that bees also use olfactory cues at their nest entrances. They have uh, these olfactory profiles. It's the same as they have on their cuticle, which is the outside of their shell. And so uh, when they got rid of these olfactory cues on their hotel rooms or homes or whatever you want to call them, the bees became disoriented, were really had a hard time finding where their house was. So olfactory cues are an important part of this, not just visual cues. So they're using multiple senses for orientation. And most likely, this is not the case just for these this one species of bee. It's probably true for lots of solitary animals that find homes and claim them as their own. And so, of course, this has implications for protection and support of bees, which we're always talking about. They're pollinators. we got to save them. So we want to make sure we're not accidentally masking the way that their homes smell. If we have our bee hotels in our backyard, you don't want to be spraying those down all the time, right. changing the way they smell, any of that stuff. Um, but that also means that uh, there's more study to be done. They want to find other solitary nesting hymenoptera, which are bee looking things. Is <laughs> the scientific way to say that. Um, so they want to find other solitary bee looking things and see if they also do this and use the same cues because chances are they do. And then how can we help um, maintain those, those um, populations? But also if they're pests, there are also hymenopterans that are pests. So if you have a pest, is that something that you can kind of weaponize knowing how they find their home? weaponized home mm -hmm. finding. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'd be uh, like if you lost. want, yes, I'm hiding. Um, <laughs> it would be as if you want, you want some, you want a bee or a, a what is it? A, a hymenopterin, mm -hmm. solitary hymenopterin to take whatever, I guess, pest management substance <laughs> back to its home to kill its young or, you know, like we would, how would we want to uh, get rid of the, uh, the murder hornets, which I mm -hmm. believe are, they don't have large hives, but. Yeah. Or just also, if you wanted to discourage the murder hornets from being in your backyard, if you could somehow mask the, the olfactory cues around where they were living, then that might discourage them from hanging around. Right. So there's some kind of low hanging fruit involved and then there's some more complicated stuff for sure. Right. It, well, we, we know a lot of wasps and other uh, hornets, bees do use visual cues. So if they're, I, mean, I don't know, this gets at what is mo most important. If the olfaction is the only thing, can they, you know, even though they might recognize it visually, can you just confuse them just enough so they just don't go home and they don't get back there? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just enough. So, just provide just enough doubt. I I, I kind of like the, the idea though. It's like, oh, just get them out of my backyard. Well, they're gonna go somewhere. <laughs> and you know, your neighbors are gonna have the murder hornets. <laughs> Where I was like, yeah. Only if they have a good That's, hotel for them. Uh, That's them. right. Do you yeah. have a do you have a solitary pest hymenopteran hotel? Is that what you're yeah. putting together on your property? I actually see that I see that the opposite. I see this as being uh, a a a form of bee theft that will take place. <laughs> so this is a real thing. Like in in farm country, yes, we so have yeah. California has uh, eighty five percent of the. United States bees come to California at some point for the massive pollination season. And they're trucked. So these, yeah, they they're get trucked, trucked in all from over all the over. Yeah. They're contracted out. And so you have these beehives that are set up all over on, on farmland, these little boxes. And occasionally there's there's uh, bee wranglers or what are you, bee rustlers who will go and steal people's bees. I believe they're called beekeepers. <laughs> 
Yeah. No, but the, but they're but the ones that are they're rustlers. Yeah, they're, they're, they're just their their beekeeping suit is just in all black. Is the difference? Yes. <laughs> they come they just have a little mask night. over the yeah. screen at the bottom so that yeah. nobody can. And so then, it may, how easy, much easier is that job if you make the really super attractive smelling home uh, signal in, in a bunch of empties or whatever, and then all the bees are like, oh, I guess that's where we're supposed to go. And then uh, you got yourself a bunch of free bees. Potentially. So, so just but a reminder, is... though, that this is solitary bees, right? So yeah. this is not our hive bees. Yeah. Um, so, right. So at this time, based on the science we have, that would not work on the honeybees. I see I see a black market coming for bee wrangling or bee wrestling. <laughs> bee wrestling. Bee wrestling. Uh, you bee wrestling. I can't go any further. I don't know. Blair. Um, so, but my other story, the story I was really excited to bring tonight, is uh, kind of a weird deja vu for last week. So um, last week, for those of you that last time on This Week in Science, for those of you that were not here last week, for example, Kiki, I'm going to catch you up. I did a Please story me, yeah. about C. elegans, our, our nice uh, little uh, nematode wormy thing, um, that can hitch a ride on migrating or uh, just on insects um, via magnetic fields. <laughs> So they can jump crazy fast. Just they they hitch a ride on the on the electric field between them and like a bumblebee, bop onto the bumblebee, and then they can hitch a ride on the bumblebee. So sea elegans, yes, yeah. little nematodes, yes. yeah, yeah, it, like, like nightmare inducing leaping ability. Yes. Whoa. So uh, if you thought okay. that was a nightmare, yeah. Justin, okay. yeah. I have something even better for you this week. Oh, good. It's ticks. <laughs> Jumping no. via static electricity. No. Yes. Oh, no. So this is a study from University of Bristol. And uh, they wanted to see how ticks are getting on to uh, individual animals because they don't have a physical. Sorry. Physical mechanism for jumping. So they can't jump. So how does the tick get from the tall grass onto your leg or onto your dog or onto the rabbit or whatever it is, unless they're brushed up against very specifically, right? And if they were waiting for that, they probably wouldn't be very successful parasites. So the mechanism, these researchers believe, for how they're able to make contact with hosts that are beyond direct touch is static electricity. Ooh. Yes. So this is, okay. uh, to the researcher's knowledge, the first known example of static electricity being implicated in the attachment of an animal to another animal. <laughs> and so for any of us that had shed carpet growing up or played with balloons in our hair or had um, would shuffle around in our socks, we we're very familiar with electrostatic charges and how they work. But uh, this also happens to animals in nature when they rub against grass, sand, or other animals. And that charge can actually be pretty high, <laughs> equivalent to hundreds, if not thousands of volts. So that's uh, more than you would get from, don't do it, but more than you would get from sticking your finger in a socket. So, <laughs> so it can be, you know, it's short-lived, but it can be a pretty strong electric charge. And so researchers wondered if the ticks could be lifted through the air via electrostatic attraction onto the animals. So for starters, they used statically charged rabbit fur and other materials. They brought them close to the ticks and they wanted to see if they were attracted. Um, and so that, this is what you're about to see if you're watching the video. Uh, they were rapidly pulled through the air across oh, air gaps of several millimeters or centimeters. They say it's equivalent to humans jumping up several flights of stairs. Yeah. By these charged surfaces. Oh gosh. So then they wanted to look further. I'm just thinking it's not jumping, it's being attracted to the top <laughs> yeah, it's of the a stairs. Suck. It's, they were sucked. <laughs> <You're> just... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly you're pulled. <laughs> you're pulled. Absolutely. You're yanked. Now, now, um, but it's not just like there is in that video, at least 
The little tick puts up its little forearm limb thingies, legs, whatever those are. I don't even uh-huh. know what's in the front of a tick. Legs. They're like, legs. It, 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 it they're like puts them. So they it, it like legs, raises yeah. them up right before. So it must be sensing the pull of some uh, in some is, way. Is because... it or is it bracing itself? <sighs> Ah, right so anyway yeah. um so then in this next one this is what kiki's showing now they use the previous measurements of the typical charge carried by the rabbit fur to mathematically predict the strength of the electric field that would be generated between an animal and grass so they were actually wanted to see kind of what would naturally happen by an animal brushing through the grass and creating static electricity then they, they then place ticks underneath an electrode with an air gap in between, increase the charge of the electrode until the ticks were attracted onto the electrode. And by doing that, they could determine a minimum electric field strength that they needed. And it was well within the order of magnitude predicted by their calculations. So it is highly likely that ticks in nature are being attracted onto hosts by static electricity. So what can we do with this information besides never go outside again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, I work yeah. in parks now, so uh, that's not an option. And in fact, I'm hiking through tall grass pretty often, so I can't yeah. not go outside. So knowing about this. <laughs> what can you use? You could take a dryer sheet and uh, rub a dryer sheet all over your clothing or your hair to reduce yes. static. There's also an entire yeah. field now of research available for anti-static spray mm. that you can apply to yourself, to your dogs, to farm animals, that you could try to reduce ticks getting on you. Um, but this Maybe is also a way you could like drag a, a grounding wire behind yourself. <laughs> yeah, like those cars that you see, they've got the yeah. little thing that's touching oh, the, the road. Or like when you're you're building computers, you always want to have the anti-static mat with the you know you're grounded so that the static doesn't build up when you're building mm-hmm. your computer. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think I think also this is just a really good educational moment to explain to people why they have to wear long socks <laughs> and they shouldn't wear shorts when they go out in the grass, even if they're walking through grass that's not as tall as their socks, right? So I got my yeah. high top h- hiking boots on. I'm not going in tall grass. Well, guess what? <laughs> if you're walking <laughs> through grass at all, you're creating a static charge and mm-hmm. therefore ticks could get sucked onto your legs no matter what you're wearing. So if you have long socks and long pants, you are infinitely less likely to end up with a tick in contact with your skin. Right. So. Yeah. So, like, so if you understand the mechanics, it's not just can a tick reach me. It's I'm physically creating a charge that sucks ticks onto my body. <laughs> I always imagine ticks as existing on tree branches and that you walk underneath the trees I, and they drop on you yes. from the sky. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. They're like parachuting down. Um, so the other thing onto you. Yeah. is that this likely also applies to other parasitic species. So mm-hmm. does this happen with mites? Does it happen with fleas or lice? Lice. That would be excellent mm. to know. If you can spray your hair mm. down with anti-static spray when you have a lice breakout in your child's classroom, will that reduce the likelihood that you'll end up with lice in your home? These are all really great questions Amazing. that are kind of the door has been opened to look at that. And the next step for this particular research team, to your point, Justin, is to see whether ticks are capable of sensing the approaching electrostatic charge of their prospective host and if they alter their behavior at all. So is that hand movement because they're sensing it and they're trying to catch it? Is the hand movement because they're sensing it and they're trying to brace themselves? Or is this just do they get thrust upward and there's no choice in the matter whatsoever? Yeah. The way, the way it looked to me, mm. my interpretation was <laughs> that it was kind of bracing for the move, but getting ready for the landing, you know, like, uh, like they're like, okay, uh, I am ready. Let's go. <laughs> right. Yeah. So can't, do they know it's coming? That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. So that's, they don't know, that's what but hopefully they know. Means. Yeah. yeah, hopefully we'll have more on that later. And so that is my second week in a row of electrically charged jumping organisms onto other organisms. I love it. I can't believe it. This is this is a whole 
area of study, the static electricity realm, you know, just electricity in the air on us. Between, you know, there's so much that we haven't looked into. Oh my goodness. I love it. Justin, what do you have? I have uh, the entire history of evolution to, to the origin of the human species. It's Sounds actually like a all long been... show. No. <laughs> yeah. It's a long story. Yeah. But this is this has been rewritten in just the past few years. And likely we'll go through a few more rounds of revision uh, before we approach something resembling the actual past. Ooh. We pause for one moment as a child makes noises in the background. Uh, where was I? Oh, gosh. Just let me know when you need the elevator hold music, Justin. Yeah, we'll play it right now. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so in the latest version of what we thought we knew but were wrong about, archaeological evidence from across human history, it's a little bit going back into prehistory, is challenging the whole men hunted and women gathered trope. Turns out, men hunted and also women hunted. And men and also shocked. <sighs> yeah. What? What? <laughs> there was better division of roles and... There wasn't what? any. Yeah. <laughs> so, like... Everybody did. Well, part of it's always been a little bit silly, like... You know, men hunted and women uh, gathered has always been a little, like the part that actually used to throw me was like, so men walked past a bush covered in berries and went, oh, I wish I knew how to pick those. Uh, too bad I can't. Uh, I got to find a woman. She'll know how to get those berries off of that bush. So part of it's just never made any sense whatsoever. But I, I honestly took for granted the thing I'd been, you know... Justin, told I was, that the... I've been I've been thinking about it though, as the men are out hunting and they come across the berries and then eat them themselves and don't share them with anybody. Oh, but the women oh. go. They're out. like, I crave sustenance because I'm doing this hard hunting work. Never mind the <laughs> just, women who are raising all the never children. That's easy. Bringing it home. Yeah, they don't just... bring it home. They're bringing the the hunting provisions home. Only the women they can't eat share the foraging yeah. provisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's perfect. I didn't yeah. even, I'd never considered it that way. So researchers, researchers analyzed data from uh, 100 years of uh, 63 foraging societies from around the world, including pretty, it looks like everywhere. North, South America, Africa, Australia, Asia, the Oceanic region. I don't know what got left out. Women hunters were identified in 79% of the analyzed societies, regardless of their status as mothers. Hunting by women found in the research uh, appears to target game of all sizes, but most often large animals. Analysis also did reveal that uh, women were actively involved in teaching the hunting practices, often employed a greater variety of weapon choice in hunting strategies than men. There was some division of sexes involved in that women were more likely to hunt in groups, whereas men were more likely to hunt uh, either with one or two, like solo or maybe just with one hunting partner. Women were also more, much more likely to hunt with dogs, suggesting... Interesting that dogs may first have been a woman's best friend mm. before, <laughs> before a man. Interesting. Yeah, so also findings suggest that women were skilled hunters, had an interest and a very involved instrumental role in the practice. Authors note that stereotypes about gender roles have influenced previous archaeological studies, with some res researchers reluctant to interpret objects buried with women as hunting tools, but rather huh. ceremonial of course, offerings. Right. Or, or the other way around, identifying female remains as males mm -hmm. based on weapons or hunting the tools weapons, being yeah. in the grave. 
So okay. they call for a reevaluation of a lot of past archaeological evidence, caution against misapplying the idea of men as hunters and women as gatherers in future research. And one of the things I also kind of find interesting is we, one of the theories of language that has uh, sort of been offered out there from time to time was the importance of, of communication in an organized hunt for a group with an organized hunting strategies to be able to coordinate and communicate all of what's going on during that hunt. And if it turns out that men were hunting by themselves, <laughs> didn't really need to develop a whole lot of communication skills. But if women were hunting in groups and with dogs, there was all sorts of communication and signaling and, and everything with else. with men, and it, 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 they were there all hunting together, it, right? Yeah, but it talk. might mean that women are also not only in charge of the, the, the responsible for the domestication of dogs more so than men, but also maybe <laughs> more heavily involved in the invention of communication. You're saying women are better at communicating than men? No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying they're better. I'm <laughs> saying that they may it may have been their idea. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, all along. So, where did this? idea originally come from that men hunted and women gathered when did oh, this happen oh that's obvious that's obvious that came from men yeah yes. anthropologists well like like, all... like white men in in like in like tweed jackets with no, elbow patches no no no, right? no, no, no 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 this is but they came from before tweed jackets when men were wearing nothing but uh togas oh god we started this, uh, these ideas those guys these are, these are pretty it. old ideas but one of the one of the uh, one of the interesting things is along the theme of not knowing history. Uh, almost everything that we think we know historically turns out to be absolutely make it up nonsense, passed through some filter of one or two historians who are like, "Ah, eh, this is probably how it was. Sure, yeah. why not? I'll write yeah. it down, and people will repeat this for the next yeah, because the patriarchy." Years. Or the Bible, or years. any yeah. number of things. Yeah, yeah. Because somebody wrote it in a book, so now everybody has to believe it. Yeah, it's kind of how the power of media was once upon a time. My final story for tonight. This is uh, researchers at the University of Copenhagen have figured out how hepatitis C avoids the human body's immune defenses, so that it can persist, go around, kind of seems to go away, and then. Uh, comes back with another chronic reinfection. And there's a few people who've got hepatitis C. Apparently 50 million people worldwide. Something in that ballpark. So and it, and it causes inflammation, scarring of the liver. Uh, when you have damage to an organ, you need to repair it. And every once in a while, those repairs go wrong. And then that leads to cancer. So it's a... Uh, Terrible, awful disease, evades the human immune system, and spreads throughout the body. But how it does it has been eluding researchers. Despite the fact that it is one of the most studied viruses that uh, causes a pathology on, the, on this planet. So, University of Copenhagen and Hospital, which I can't pronounce despite my youngest <laughs> child being born there. <laughs> <laughs> Child, is, where, were you, where were you, son? You were born in the hospital. Like, that's the best <laughs> you'll ever know, of, from me at least. <laughs> anyway, they, they teamed up and they discovered the virus just puts on a mask. Uh, by donning a mask, the virus can remain hidden while making copies of itself to infect new cells. The mask cloaks the virus in the form of a molecule that is already in our cells and and everywhere. So it disguise, disguised by this molecule, our immune system uh, can, is confused. The virus uh, looks like it's something harmless, so there's no reaction. The camouflage being used by the hepatitis virus, the mask, to hide in our cells is called FAD, a molecule composed of vitamin B2 and ATP. So... Fat is vital for cells to convert energy. The fat molecule's importance and ubiquitous familiarity throughout our cells makes it ideal camouflage because 
It's conserved to the point where it's ignored entirely. It's on the team. It's on team bodies so much so that there's no there's no checking of credentials of fad at any point in, in our immune system. The researchers turned to Arabidopsis. Okay, boom. We're now at this uh, teeny tiny little plant that's been researched. Uh, uh, probably the best researched plant genomically uh, out there. There's an enzyme for Arabidopsis that is known to be able to split the fad molecule in two. Using the enzyme, the researchers were able to split fad and prove that hepatitis C virus was hiding inside. What's really interesting is that this is, a, uh, despite all the study, this is the first time it's been seen. And it's likely not the only virus that's using this technique. So there's a lot of viruses that hide out in the system that are chronic, that last, you know, or super long time, which is kind of weird because a virus has got to infect other cells to exist. So how can it just be kind of disappearing and then reappearing? They, uh, yeah, they find it, it basically, it's kind of wearing it like a mask, almost sounds like a hat, like one end of the, the virus is, right. is being covered by the fad material and the other ones out there are looking for other cells to infect. But as long as it's wearing the hat or the mask, it doesn't, there's no reason for the body to think that it's weird at all. And so the body goes, hey, you're cool. You're, you're part of the whole system. I like your hat. I have a hat just like it. We like it. We like, can I borrow your hat? And so then they connect with the hat and bring it on in and then hepatitis C gets access and can can be on in there, right? This is a quote from Yepa yeah. Vinther, one of the researchers on the project. All RNA viruses have the same need to hide from the immune system, and there's a good chance that this is just the beginning. Now that we're attuned to this trick, it opens up the possibility of developing new and perhaps improved methods of tracking and treating viral infections in the future. So Medical science, mm -hmm. uh, one more uh, thing that we're probably not going to have to worry about. <laughs> we're gonna... Hey, look, it's another the whole thing with the kids of tomorrow, right? They're going to look back. People had viral infections, genetic-based diseases. What? Are, how do you have a genetic-based disease? That doesn't make any sense. Just fix it. And you put it in the thing and take the... Uh, gene editing and then you just fix it gosh just fix it we'll do everything easy as pie i think i love the idea though that this is a way to potentially look for other you know intruders how many hats how many masks are out there that are yeah. essential to cell function that become you know a, a costume that allow bad things to get entry and not and be attacked even just by the immune at the system. Same one. Even yeah. if the same one could be used by other viruses. They've just yeah. they've just now, as we are speaking, and maybe last week, <laughs> uh, uh, discovered that this is a place where a virus can hide. And we don't and so want it could that. Be, could be all of them. Could be all of the chronic viral reinfections are all hiding in the same place. It would be a great, it's a great hiding place if you think about it. Hide all over. They could be everywhere. I mean, this could explain a lot of, a lot of things for diseases and various factors. Going back, I've got a couple of stories to end this show on. Uh, Blair was talking earlier about the, uh, the sense of of uh, of how bees find their homes. Possibly, we're talking about recognizing different different things. There have been some great stories throughout the show. Um, you were talking. I don't know a lot of things that we were discussing, but I have some fun stories that kind of fit in with these already. Uh, publishing out of Florida International University in Plus One. Researchers have uh, done a small study. It's not 
huge study, although the headlines would have you think it's a huge study, uh, but these researchers are investigating how the scent of your hand or the scents that are left because of the odorant molecules, the bacteria, the sweat, the sebaceous secretions that come off your hands that you leave around behind you, how easily they can identify individuals. And this is for purposes of forensic science. For um, by, by being the able hand? to use Yes, or, the or by the, the scent the hand leaves behind. By the scent the hand leaves behind. Okay, got it. Okay. And so in this in this study, they got people to hold on to little cotton things and leave their sebaceous secretions and hand leavings all over the cotton padding. And then they put them through mass spectrometer to determine what was there. And then they started putting together a statistical model that could help determine who was leaving what behind. And in the process of what they were what they showed with their multivariate regression modeling, they were able to, based on 18 individuals within 60 that had been sampled, 18 of the individuals had uh, stated whether or not they were male or female. So we're just looking at these two genders specifically. And they've, they had gone through and gotten gotten uh, data with the mass, mass spectrometer of all the compounds that had been left behind by the various individuals on those little cotton pads. So we've got all sorts of odorant molecules like octanol, tetradecane, linalool, phenol, tridecane, pentadecane, like all sorts of naphthalene, all sorts of things left behind from people's hands. And Instead of looking exactly at certain compounds, they started doing this multivariate regression, just saying, okay, we'll just use a couple of these factors. And then once we add in a third factor, let's see where we can go. And they determined that with just three factors, they were able to tell specifically between males and females in the grouping, that male and female hand scent prints are completely recognizable that when they started diving into the samples, they uh, provided very, very identifying gender-based fingerprints. Because hormones? Because hormones, probably. Is it? Um, is it? Or, and, and, and it's, I'm going to speculate before you tell me if, if we know. We don't know. They didn't. Oh, they didn't okay. look specific. They didn't have enough just, individuals. Just gonna, gonna, gonna I know. Paint, paint with some broad brushes related to I gender. Now, got it figured it. out. I've got it hundred percent figured out. This is easy. This is. I, don't I, even I know why hold this on. Is a question. Side bet. Side bet. Whether or not they uh -huh. wash their hands. Yes, no. that's exactly what I was gonna guess. No, no, <laughs> that's not. What, well, okay, yeah. yeah. So that and. This is very this is very much just based on my experience with all humans. Every single one of them. Uh I don't know a single man who uses hand lotions or puts <laughs> lotions on their faces or puts lotions on their skin or uses a moisturizer yeah. or does you any of don't? that. But I don't know a woman who doesn't. I know a lot of men that use hand Actually, lotions I know some because they work but, uh, with their hands and their hands are cracked in a mess. And so they use hand lotions. Okay. But, so, okay. This, okay. There can be some. I'm not so saying one of the this, things that they did in the study I was, was they, with a broad brush. <laughs> they made sure people did not wash their hands for one hour before the study. But I do not know if they told them not to put on any lotions or uh, anything right. of that sort. Well, and um, do they so, use scented soaps or any of these right, other right. things? But yeah. So, but can I, they were I, I, able, I, I, regardless, these individuals, nine of males and nine of females, 18 individuals out of 60, they were able to, with like a 96, almost 97% accuracy, identify the gender just based 
on compounds that were present. They didn't break it down to specific compounds. And they so they that would be the next step of the research is to actually start putting together, quote unquote, a fingerprint of the hand sense. Um, but, you know, and this is with people who okay. identify specific as male and female so we're not even opening the right. box of no. you know the, the 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 diversity of gender identification and how this <laughs> could you know change it, what would happen if you'd actually look at things more complex with more complexity right and, you know? and the chat room is completely correcting me of, of <laughs> men in the chat room or husbands who use lotion lots of lotions uh, it's <laughs> apparently just me However, it's just you. I'm now I'm not jumping on to Blair's side bet. I want to go that route with the hygiene because there was something that I hadn't noticed uh, before, but I have a antiperspirant, you know, an underarm deodorant kind of thing that you put on. Uh, it's in their cabinet. And I, I, for the first time, noticed that it has 48 hour protection uh, is, is listed on there. And I go, and I realized like the only reason you would need 48 hour protection, uh, antiperspirant is if you don't plan on bathing for 48 hours. And then I'm thinking, I wonder it's how only often one somebody's missed like, shower. That's not I too wonder bad. how many folks look at that and go, you know, this will give me another 48 hours <laughs> on top of the 48 hours. Cause I, you know, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm, I think Blair's hygiene hypothesis. No, right? no, that's, I didn't actually take that seriously. I thought that's where you were going. But <laughs> what I th what I was expecting this story to be about was about exactly what you said, Kiki, like a fingerprint, yeah. right? Like being able to use it in court to say, like, your hand smell is all over this crime, right? <laughs> but it's well, but if it's only if they've only so far figured out male female that's not because that's the first thing i thought of is like if you change your diet if you change your soap if you're uh mm -hmm. if it's hot versus if what it's are cold the out, yeah like uh, if you're a woman if it, like where you are in your hormone cycle like all these things could impact the chemical composition of what's going into the sweat that you're releasing on your hands it seems mm -hmm. like it'd be super variable it seems like it would be but apparently with this small sample size they and people who identified specifically male or female, they were able to uh, get that discrimination very strongly in their data. So, uh, you know, could this potentially be used down the line for forensic analysis of crime scenes? I mean, at this point, it's probably better to use the scent detection of a dog you know, at a crime scene looking at, oh, you left behind a, a scent. Okay, dog, fi Fido, figure out which of the people on the lineup smell like this, you know. Um, that's probably a more highly <laughs> accurate methodology than using uh, this at, at this point in time. And probably easier than trying to wipe down for sebaceous secretions and take it to a mass spectrometer to get the data to be able to do, you know, there's a lot there. So, yeah. John Hogan, I don't know how many people like shaking sweaty hands. I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, I did my my inside joke to myself about this whole story though is like, is this giving another meaning to the phrase smell my finger? But anyway. <laughs> just smell my finger. It's fine. What was the first meaning? <laughs> yeah, where was that finger? What was the joke? No, it's something. I'm sure it's something pre. You're saying pre -teen it's another children. meaning. I I don't yeah. think I understood the first <laughs> run at smell my finger. All right, that's why I should just keep these inside jokes inside and just keep them inside the Kiki brain. Uh, speaking of brains, researchers are trying to make monkeys smarter. Well, about I mean, time. The end, the about end time. goal is yeah, it's okay. We got to make all the monkeys smarter. Um, really though, the 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 study put together by researchers at Yale and University of California, San Francisco, published in Nature Aging this last week, uh, is attempting to investigate molecular components uh, of uh, our metabolism that might be involved in healthier aging, potentially trying to find treatments or new drugs or supplements that could lead to uh, 
improving memory, especially as we know, memory is supposed to deteriorate as we get older, especially if we're looking at neurodegenerative diseases. Are there ways that we can hold that deterioration off and keep memory strong and cognitive function going at youthful level levels for lifelong? Um, they used a compound called clotho, Clotho, who is also known as the uh, Greek goddess of fate. Uh, in this, this, this molecule, this protein is produced by the kidneys and it circulates in the blood. It doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, which I think is really fascinating, but in multiple studies has been shown to impact memory and cognitive function in mice, in worms like C. elegans, um, don't think it has anything to do with static electricity, but uh, somehow clotho, which is produced in the kidney, um, it helps keep us healthy and it impacts factors that then go on to impact the brain and boost cognition. So these researchers wanted to know how clotho um, influences primates, not just mice. So they started with mice and injected the mice with, um, injected the mice with clotho. And they showed that they were able to get in a change in using rhesus macaque clotho, clotho that had been isolated from kidneys of rhesus macaques. Uh, they showed that they were able to increase the brain activity of the mice with an injection of clotho. And also improve the uh, the performance of the mice when they were choosing between two arms of a Y-shaped maze. Very simple tests, but they showed that there was an improvement in the mice. And so they were like, okay, it works in the mice. Great. So now let's take the clotho that we've isolated from the kidneys of the rhesus macaque and actually give it to rhesus macaques. And in giving it to the rhesus macaques, they then showed that they were able to get uh, upregulation and changes in the serum levels of clotho in the macaques. And so they showed, ah, this baseline level of 10 micrograms per kilogram. That's great. That's working. That's what we're going to use. And so they moved on to um, doing behavioral tests on these rhesus macaques after they had injected them with the clotho. And they showed that the rhesus macaques actually improved on a test of memory. So they had a very simple test of memory that uh, the macaques had to determine where some food was in a tray. They cued them and then tested them on this, this test moving on over a month or so. And they showed that even after two weeks, even though the clotho deteriorated in the body, in the serum within about 48 hours, the impact on memory and cognition lasted at least two weeks which was how long they were testing the monkeys. So uh, the monkeys, the macaques, they got a little brain boost from a little bit of clotho. Now, will this work in humans? We don't know. Uh, will it even be something that will be useful in humans? We don't know. I'll how try does it. it work in the brain? I'll try it. We don't know. I'll try it. <laughs> You're like, I'm in. <laughs> I'll be the guinea pig. Anything that could make me smarter. Like, I would, re like, I'm desperate to be smarter than I am. <laughs> like, you I really. your memory, right? Oh, if I had a memory, I would be un, what's the word? Uh, Just a memory? Could make me more, like, a word that means, like, better, but uh, in a larger, I don't know. But that's why I need it. Because I can't remember anything. Yeah, and so the, the question is, you know, what kind of dosage could be used in humans? Uh, this is rhesus macaque clotho. Could we isolate it from human from humans? And would a similar dosage work? Um, is there a, an impairment of function at a certain dose level? So there are lots of questions about clotho. And I mean, honestly, it's how does it work? Why does it work? Uh, what's actually going on there? Like, why impact clotho? I mean, it's one target, but it doesn't even cross the blood-brain barrier. So, I mean, is it, if you impact clotho, and does it have just better general effects just for health? Does it impact other things than memory? Is it just generally good? 
why don't we target? I mean, I guess it's easier than targeting something within the brain and trying to get past the blood brain barrier. So that's, um, you know, an aspect of, it would be a, an easier application of the, of a drug if that's what they needed to do. But yeah, we're boosting the memory of macacus. So, but it's, it's, I'm sorry, uh, generated in the liver? In the kidneys. In the kidneys. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it circulates in the blood. It was discovered in 1997 in, uh, at the National Institute of Neuroscience in Tokyo. And uh, originally it was determined that Mike, mice who were knockouts, who had no clotho, uh, had uh, a lot of aging. They had like a, a what they called a, a syndrome that resembles human aging, early onset disease, heart disease, cancer, cognitive decline, organ failure, um, all sorts of things. And if clotho was reintroduced to those knockout mice, then they lived they lived longer. And the clotho was actually able at the the doses they gave the mice, they was actually able to in, improve their life and extend the life pan, lifespan above normal mice. So Oh. Hey Blair. Yeah. You want to you want to join me in a completely unstudied uh, experiment <laughs> uh, where we uh, see if I can get smarter and you can live longer? What do you think about it? <laughs> She's like, I'm making a person right now. Come on. I got yeah. other things. Two years ago. If you had asked me two years ago, the answer would have been yes immediately. Okay. Yes. Now she has to think for two. Yeah. It's what you it's what you gotta do. But yeah, we'll see. Clotho, are you going to are you going to be there for us as we age to improve our memories? Who knows? Might be something that's included in a uh, you know, nutrient supplement pack sometime soon yeah Un unregulated of course unregulated exactly yes <sighs> i think we've done it have we made That's it to it. the end of the show oh, we made it we? yeah we made it through everybody we made it through the wilderness we made it through the science and we've come out the other side into the into the afterlife of the show Dun, dun, dun. And it is time for me to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who has been a part of putting the show together. Thank you to all of you who are in the chat room right now, over in Discord, here in YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us and for chatting. And I want to say thank Fada specifically for your help on social media and show notes. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you for editing the show. I'm having all sorts of things right now. Gord, Arnlor, others, thank you for monitoring those chat rooms. And of course, I would be remiss if I spent a day not thanking our Patreon sponsors. So for July, I would like to thank... These twists, patrons, Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick, Rick Loveman, Cor George Chorus, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Begard Shefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, aka Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Don Mundus, PIG, Stephen Alberon, Dale Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Bearden, Noodles, Jack Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard Brown, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Lemmy Day, Bert G, Burton Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RTM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Rick Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Land, and Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, EO, Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if any of you out there want to join us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click the Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, and again 5 a.m. on Thursday, Central European time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. 
Hey, want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps while you try to make your own candles that smell like your hands? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes, links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org, where uh, you can also sign up for a newsletter of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. You can also contact us directly, email Kiki at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be pulled via static electricity out of the universe. We'll never hear it or see it or read it. It'll be gone. The static electricity just, it's gone. Or you can ping us on a pulsar where we are at with science at Dr. Kiki and at Jackson Fly as well as at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations. Do you have a plan? Does everybody have a plan? Does anybody no. have a plan? No. No, no plans. This is the after show, everyone. We have not planned anything. My plan is to go to bed. <laughs> yes. Well, we did a good job. It's 10 o'clock right now, and that would have been a one hour and five minute show. Itch, ish. Uh, We're about oh. 15 minutes over. 50, we started about, I mean, we started about 15 so, minutes. So late. it was a one hour and 45 minute show. Yes. Yes. Thank you, yeah. math. Yeah. I was thinking 90 minutes. Yeah. Tight 90, 90 minutes. I, I, did I say, yeah. You said one hour one, and five minutes. I was like, I that's meant not, hundred, that's, no. I meant 105 <laughs> minutes. Okay, there you You're, go. Yeah. I got yes. things. Yes. yes. I was, had the right thought, but I said yeah. the wrong things. There you go. <laughs> it's like, that math doesn't math, Kiki. <sighs> oh, my math doesn't math so often. I try. I really do try. I am not smarter than a fifth grader. Hmm. Nah. You definitely are. Yeah, possibly. I've done some more. How was our fourth? Did you enjoy the fourth? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Justin was uh, it, in Denmark. It was the worst. Like, I have never <laughs> been anywhere where Fourth of July was less celebrated than Denmark. my house maybe if yeah. you had been here <laughs> yeah really. it's i mean the dog hates fireworks so that's oh. not fun and uh i can't do anything but waddle around my house at this point so and you weren't excited about out. going out to like some uncomfortable no. park no, no i didn't want to sit on grass for several hours <laughs> at this point in time go to the bathroom in a porta potty 
Yes. Hey, this I is think if I'm reading book. my Hebrew correctly, it's Pamela is asking in the chat. Are you yes. due soon? Yes. I am due very soon. It, about uh, less than six weeks now, I guess. Less than six weeks. This yeah. is very exciting. So, the countdown maybe is sooner. on. We have no maybe idea. Sooner, maybe later. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Mid-August like is the due date. <laughs> hey. Yeah. That's so exciting. So, whatever it, whatever happens, yes, Justin, you probably have to go. And Justin I Blair wants to go, go to bed. And the but, thing is, yes, I'm going to have to go for the next three weeks. Yeah. I, I uh, mentioned that uh, to you before. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned it, it before the show. So I need to have a conversation with Blair before she has the baby about what she wants to do. Yes. And then I'll talk with Justin about what we're going to do. Hopefully the baby won't come in the next three weeks. No. no. Yeah. If it does, I I have other problems. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not ready. I, I haven't yeah, packed my hospital ready. bag yet. Things are not ready. Oh, uh, can I just, yeah. from uh, one parenting person to another uh, you're never gonna be ready. No, nah, yeah. Obviously, there's no. I could be more ready than I am no, right now, which no. I would prefer. There's no. no there's no there's... ready. Mentally, sure, fine. Physically, no, no. no. I don't have not I mentally, don't have not physically. In a bag. Not things in a bag ready. There's no ready. Yeah. There's roll right. with it. Well, that's there's not just very roll with it. Advice, but no, but it's that. but it's the it's it's the right advice. You, what you need is mm -hmm. what you need is to pack a bag that has everything in it, which I would be a bag your house. With, like shower shoes and soap <laughs> in it. Like I I just haven't done that yet. No, you need a my problem. shower soap. What are you talking about? Who's what? You don't choose. No, I have my own private shower. Shower shoes. These LED rooms. That's, that's oh, yeah. very oh, yeah. nice. Oh yeah, you're gonna. Yeah, you're gonna be your all room. like. Yeah. Now I've had a baby. I'm gonna go take no, a no. shower. No, no, the shower is for no. Durin, Justin. For Durin. <laughs> yes. Oh well, yeah. No, that's true. Yes. Yeah, that, that can yes. be a thing. Yeah. All right. I need to. I like um, how you have plans. Just be ready to throw them all away. Throw the plan. <laughs> that's the point. Is you make <laughs> a plan <laughs> and then you go and then what happens happens. But I have oh, some yeah. ideas. But you have ideas. All right, Justin. Well, I may or may not see you again for several months. We'll see. Yeah, yes. I hope you. Uh, uh, I hope this show is uh, is okay without me. <laughs> I like Pamela's uh, comment in the chat. She got pregnant for the first time ten years ago this week and still preparing. Yeah, and she has three kids. <laughs> Hi, Pam. I'm so glad you're watching. Yeah, but anyway, uh, yes, you got to go. You're going to be gone for three weeks. In three weeks, which and then Blair right. will be gone. Uh, and so, in the Maybe. meantime, we'll see. Kiki, uh, of chat, oh, let me put it this way chat room, uh, minions, twist listeners and followers, take good care of Kiki while we're gone. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. everybody's gonna take great care, and I'm gonna have one of you for a while off, but you'll, you'll alternate, so it's gonna yeah. be it's gonna be good. Blair and I are going to be like all yeah. animal and brain lo bird loving over the next couple of weeks. And then you'll come back and we're going to be like all evolution and medicine and stuff. And so it's going to be, it's going to be cool. We're going to have different fo foci. It'll be awesome. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. We'll go through it all. I hope you have a wonderful three weeks, Justin. Yeah. And yeah, Blair, what is it? Well, it's you not say? vacation. It's not vacation. No, I it's know. a complete and total lack of child care. Yeah, yeah, and I know. I hope it's you, but I, that's why I'm saying I hope you have a wonderful three weeks. I hope I it hope is I uneventful. I, yeah, I hope it's just, <laughs> I hope you get sleep and you can do it. No. Good, Papa. Good morning, Justin. <laughs> go. Good morning, Justin. <laughs> Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good, good night, night, Kiki. Kiki. Night, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for another episode of Twists. We will be back, Blair and I at least, next week. And we hope that you will join us then as well. Let's keep up the science, everybody. Justin's still going to be out there, even though he's not going to be with us here. He's, yeah, maybe, who knows? It could be a black hole for the next three weeks. We don't know what's going on until he comes back and then we see what happened. Anyway. We will see you, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and stay lucky. <laughs>